Hello. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Joe Darcy. I work in Oracle's Java Platform Group on uh, floating point and a uh, variety of other topics. I'll be tweeting a URL to the um, PDF of the slides and have a URL uh, to the slides on the, uh, at the end of the presentation. This is Oracle's safe harbor statement. You'll be seeing it a number of times uh, throughout the conference. Uh, however, I must let you know that if you're interested in safe harbors, uh, grab me during the break session. I have some other recommendations of uh, interesting safe harbors in the area. An overview of what we've been talking about today, originally Java had very straightforward floating point semantics, both in the uh, language and the VM. However, to allow um, better performance on certain popular uh, processors at the time, namely the x87 uh, floating point coprocessor, back in 1998, there were subtle changes made to the default floating point uh, semantics. So if you've come across the strict FP modifier, uh, that's when that change came in. And there's a corresponding uh, act strict bit in the classify level. And the default floating point semantics were actually redefined. Now, I think today in 2017, these looser definitions are no longer useful. And I've recently published a proposal to restore the original floating point semantics requiring strict uh, floating point in all circumstances. If you're interested in reading more about that, that's uh, JEP, uh, JDK Enhancement Proposal uh, 306. Now, here in California, we like to uh, accept and accommodate the sensitivities of uh, many people. So this is your final warning that the rest of this talk is going to be about floating point uh, arithmetic. So for a number of years, I felt that uh, many people feel about floating point the way some people feel about spiders something unpleasant that's best dealt with by someone else. Uh, so as part of the preparation for the talk, I thought I should get some data uh, to back, back up that assertion. So I did a quick survey, spiders, fear, loathing, indifference, or fascination. And as expected, there was a fair amount of uh, fear, but mostly indifference. Same questions about floating point. <laughs> it's even worse. Uh, floating point is both more feared and more loathed than, uh, sp than spiders. So hopefully, hopefully it's based on fear. At the end of the talk, uh, it won't, won't be quite as, uh, what, quite as frightening. After a bit more background, we'll have a condensed floating point primer. Then we'll talk about the peculiarities of the x87 uh, architecture, the benefits of restoring strict FP, and some uh, forward-looking statements. And uh, we probably won't have time for Q&A, but I'm happy to talk uh, during the break or elsewhere throughout the conference. So I think there are three C's of technical communication. Ideally, you can be simultaneously concise, clear, and correct. This is extra difficult with floating point because of the number of special cases. Uh, so sometimes uh, conciseness will have to be sacrificed for accuracy. So why does floating point have a bad reputation? So if you look back far enough a few decades ago, there was a lot of uh, variation of floating point um, semantics across different architectures. But starting in 1985, there was the IEEE floating point standard, and that was very quickly adopted by many processor architectures. It's uh, essentially uniform. There was a backwards compatible update to the IEEE floating point standard back in 2008, so things uh, basically haven't changed. And it's very common to find a 32-bit single float format and a 64-bit double format across platforms. And the default semantics of IEEE floating point is fundamentally very simple. You take the exact mathematical result of the operation, and you return the floating point number closest to that exact result. So that's kind of the locally optimal change. You can't really ask for more than that at a uh, lo local level. But of course, uh, as we know from uh, the poll and perhaps from the feelings in the room as well, floating point still has that bad reputation. So what are, why, why is there so much fear? For any binary floating point system, one of the problems we run into is that one-tenth is a repeating fraction in binary. That means it's not stored exactly. So this leads to a lot of uh, uh, surprising anomalies with binary decimal conversion. And things that are surprising as well, like one-tenth as a float is not equal to one-tenth as a double, because double has more precision, and the repeat's only four bits. So you have many more bits, so the values are equal. Also, the usual arithmetic properties don't hold, uh, namely associativity. So it matters what order you add up floating point numbers in. Now, it may be surprising, but uh, adding up floating point numbers is actually still a research topic. Over in the linear algebra community, they're working to get more reproducible summations despite having non-associativity, and that's, that's an ongoing effort. Now, even working past um, the uh, associativity and dominant conversion, there's a question of getting from your language to the processor, from the language to the intermediate format, 
Uh, you might have one set of semantics. Uh, we can go to see that on the next slide. So in the Java ecosystem, we have uh, very explicit and precise specifications to uh, cover the floating point semantics going from the Java level to the class file level. And for the um, Java virtual machine specification, constrains the mapping from the class file to the VM. Now, if you're working on uh, a different language environment that's targeting the VM, there's some other specification force that may be less precise or uh, maybe not specified at all. And likewise, if you're outside this ecosystem, you can have some completely different mapping that doesn't go through the, the VM at all. So uh, variations in the mapping at the levels is another reason floating point has a bad reputation or people are, have a fear of it. This is a uh, quote from the beginning of the preface of the first Java language specification, and I think it's a very uh, important summary of the Java philosophy. Except for timing dependencies or other non-determinisms, and given sufficient time and sufficient memory space, a Java program should compute the same result on all machines and in all implementations. Now, if you were a skeptic of Java, you might read this and say, well, this is kind of a vacu vacuously true statement of any platform. Except for all the non-determinisms, it's deterministic. Uh, that, that's true for anything. Uh, but there really is a big difference here, especially compared to comparing Java to something like C. We have to worry about the sizes of ints and pointers and you know, side effects during, during expression evaluation. And this philosophy, uh, I think, led to with a reasonable amount of uh, discipline, you could get predictable programs, even if you looked very closely, they weren't exactly reproducible in terms of timing effects and the like. And this philosophy uh, also extended to the floating point area for numerics. Also for this conference, uh, when I was uh, doing uh, research, this is a uh, quote from the introduction of the virtual machine uh, specification, noting way back in 1997 that even at that time, uh, multiple language implementers were uh, targeting the VM. I think it's uh, been very heartening to see the work that's been discussed at this conference over the years to see this uh, vision fulfilled over time. The original uh, VM specification also covered floating point. Uh, basically, it says for the floating point types, you have to use exactly the IEEE types, these uh, float and double, 32 and 64 bit. And for the operations on those types, you have to do what IEEE says you have to do for those types. Uh, in particular, you also have to support the subnormal values, those uh, small values uh, close to zero. So all this is, is very uh, straightforward and allows a pretty direct mapping from language to VM to uh, hardware instruction. If you look at the virtual machine specifications uh, since 1.2, uh, these are some quotes from uh, Jesse 8, it's not quite as simple. There's a discussion of value sets. Well, what, what's a value set? Well, that, that's defined in the specification here. It's, it starts talking about extended exponents, so sometimes you can use more exponent range than just the floater double. And it makes the important point that these value sets are not types. Uh, this, this is very, very strange. So the, the first sentence in a course about uh, type theory is usually some, some variation of a type is a set of values. So here in the virtual machine spec, a type is instead a set of a set of values, which of course is not the same. So, so this is uh, looking a little odd. Now we have these different value sets, so there's a conversion to find among them, and sometimes it's permitted and other times it's required. So this is allowing more uh, wiggle room in the spec than we're used to seeing for this sort of uh, aspect of the platform. Uh, so what happens when you have this value set conversion? Uh, goes on here to discuss it. This is the important form here, is that you're converting from one set of numerical values to another, and there can be a difference. So you have some rounding operation that's going on. So some changes being made to a value computed by the program. So what difference can that make in practice? Uh, so I, I was going to try to do a demo of this. I did manage to make a hotspot uh, display this behavior here. If you multiply these two carefully chosen floating point values together, you can get two different answers. Uh, but ju just showing that on the screen uh, isn't very helpful. But I, I can demonstrate it if needed that I, it is actually possible. So why, why is this allowed? Or what, what's happening here to explain why these particular values are leading to uh, a uh, multiple uh, answers. That's what we'll answer in the rest of the talk. So let's uh, start looking at the details here. So we start out with some Java source code. We want to compile that down to class file. So if we have a product method that wraps a multiply, at the class file level, this turns into a wrapper mounted demo instruction, which is what we'd expect. Now let's declare it strict FP, that modifier that says you have to use the 
exact semantics that were defined originally. All right, so now we have a strict product instead, and we compile that down to class files, and we get basically the exact same thing, except the act strict bit is set on the method. Now, this is JVMLS, so uh, just bytecode's not low enough, so what does this look like when we further compile down to assembly? Using enough options, you could convince a hotspot to not inline and show this to you. So if we uh, look at the assembly generated on a uh, x64 machine for the non-strict case, again, we see in, we get a wrapper around an SSC multiply instruction, which is what we, we'd expect. If we take the uh, strict FP version of this method and we look at the assembly we get for it, it's essentially the same. It's a wrapper around the same SSC multiply method. So we're not going to get any difference in behavior here because the same uh, hardware instructions is being executed. Now, if we go back and instead use the 32-bit um, uh, x87 floating point instructions uh, using a few more options to convince hotspot to do that, we get a wrapper around a different uh, double multiply instruction here. These are the older x87 instructions. And this simple instruction sequence is the one that can return uh, a different result from the strict case. So the code is, the uh, assembly code is very understandable, but it's actually doing something uh, subtly different. Now, if we take the strict FP method instead and we compile this down to x87 and we look what we get, we get something a bit surprising. We don't get one multiply instruction, we get a bunch of multiply instructions. So first, we load this uh, extraordinarily uh, tiny constant, uh, two to the minus 10 to the 15,000. We multiply by that, we do another multiply, then we multiply by 2 to plus 15,000, which is, seems like undo the first one. And um, then we have a load store. So what's going on here? This is rather confusing. Maybe it even looks kind of buggy. Because after all, why would you store something to one address and then load it right back in? While it looks like there, uh, some of these instructions here might be extraneous, these are actually all necessary. And this is the best known technique to implement uh, strict double floating point semantics on the x87. So now we'll transition to the condensed floating point primer to understand what's going on here. So this will be uh, as much as needed to understand the strict FP, default FP, and a little bit more, because uh, floating point is just uh, that much fun. So if we want to have a uh, uh, condensation of the different ma mathematical systems we've seen uh, throughout our education, we start out uh, with counting numbers, then we have addition, once we have addition, we want to invert it with subtraction. Now, once we have subtraction, uh, we define new kinds of numbers, zeros and negative numbers, the ones we didn't have before. Something similar happens with multiplication and division. Uh, once we have division, then we get rational numbers, so a whole different kind of number. And this happens a few more times. We want to start taking roots of polynomials, so we can talk about things like the length of a uh, diagonal of a square. We get something called algebraic numbers. And once we want to start talking about circles and their circumferences, uh, we have a more complicated thing going on, and we get full, full real, real numbers. Now, uh, algebraic numbers, uh, real numbers, and rational numbers uh, are a very uh, useful kind of mathemat mathematical object called a field. A field satisfies these uh, field axioms. And of course, these are also properties that uh, enable a lot of optimizations that uh, compiler writers like to do. And from this point of view, you can think of mathematics uh, sort of the same way as a game. There's a set of rules, there's objects living uh, within those rules, and you can explore the results in that framework. And just like you can get expansion packs to games, uh, we've seen you can get expansion packs to the mathematical things we have. And while things like negative numbers and, uh, and, and fractions might appear strange or different at first, as we come to uh, work with them, they become familiar. And perhaps something similar will happen with uh, computer arithmetic, because the same trick has been done before in terms of completing operations and having to add new kinds of values. So what is floating point arithmetic? Floating point arithmetic is a systematic approximation to real arithmetic, and it approximates real arithmetic in several dimensions. It both approximates the set of values you can represent, and it also uh, approximates the properties of the operations over those values. Uh, so in particular, uh, the field axioms here in orange do not hold for floating point arithmetic. So you see many of them don't hold. In particular, we don't have associativity. And uh, in terms of being able, uh, not being able to say uh, uh, things that are both concise and accurate, 
commutativity only holds if you uh, use the right sort of equivalence uh, operation. You have to use kind of a, a bitwise equivalence or semantic equivalence uh, rather than uh, the equals equals operation from a floating point standard. So it's hard to uh, make simple statements. The revision of the IEEE standard had a very helpful uh, conceptual diagram to delineate different levels of floating point. So up at the top, the mathematical system being approximated is extended reals, real numbers with plus and minus infinity. Then we can talk through a rounding process about the floating point data. Uh, those are the representable floating point numbers. The way those values are represented in the floating point system in terms of the fields of a floating point number. And finally, at the lowest level, the different bit strings uh, used uh, to store that. And we, we, you, usually we can say at the top uh, three levels and not have to worry very much about the encoding. What do the values look like? We have a sign times significant times base to the exponent. And you can fully characterize the values you can store in a format based on the um, width of the exponent, uh, the range of values it can take on, as well as the number of precision di uh, digits you have or precision bits. So for, bi for binary, we have eight uh, exponent bits and 24 precision bits. Now, if you're saying that adds up to 32, that is correct. And there is a sign bit in there, but with some clever encoding, we can get one of the bits back. Uh, so it all works out. Similarly, for double, we have a, a larger exponent range uh, with uh, 11 bits, and we have a 53 bits of precision. In terms of how the floating point numbers are structured, um, the uh, significant uses a normalized notation uh, usually. That means the leading bit is one. Uh, and then it can take on all the other values. So a number of consequences of this uh, representation. Floating point, you know, finite floating point numbers uh, are sums of powers of two, where the distance between the powers by two isn't that great. It's bounded by the number of precision bits uh, you have. So floater double are too large to fit on a, lot, a slide, so instead we're going to start with a toy format. So let's say instead of uh, 24 or 53 bits of precision, we're just going to have three bits of precision and three exponent values. And we can write down uh, the values like this. Uh, zero is a special case. But now we can see the normalized representation. We have uh, the leading bit is one in all these cases. And if we start by looking at the cases where the exponent is minus one, we just have all the possible combinations of the significant values from zero, zero through zero, one. Now, there's a few things we can observe here. Uh, for the values where the exponent is minus one, the distance between successive values is the same. It's one eighth in, in each case. When we change exponent values, the distance between uh, the numbers doubles, but it's, it's again the same within that exponent range. It can be helpful if we graph these values. So here's the real number line, and we can start filling in the values with exponent of uh, minus one, uh, zero, and one. Now you'll notice even in this toy format, there's a very large gap between zero and the first representable number than between the first and second representable numbers. So, that, so that's, that's kind of a problem uh, numerically. So we'd like to fill that in instead. And we can do that with what are called uh, subnormal numbers. Sub meaning uh, below the normal numbers. And you'll notice, uh, unlike the normalized values, their leading bit is zero instead of one. Now there are other formats we can define. So this is kind of the base toy format. But we can also define, say, an extended exponent uh, toy format. Oh, here are the subnormal values. Extended exponent toy format, where we go down to minus two instead of minus one. So we have all the normalized values we had uh, previously. Then we get another set of values with the exponent of two and a different set of subnormals. Now you'll notice that all the uh, subnormal values we had in the base format are representable values in the extended exponent format. However, some of the subnormals on the first format are normal values in the extended exponent format because we have more exponent range. So the representation of a given value differs depending on the details of the format. And we can graph that as well. We can get the toy format back. We have the extended exponents, so they're the same. Now we fill in the values where the exponent is minus two and the new subnormals. OK. So floating point um, is imprecise. There's only so many answers we have, so there are only 16 non-negative finite values. So we can write them all down here. So these are the choices we have to return. So 
what should we return for adding one half to one, to one, one and a quarter? Well, the exact value is 1.75. We can look here off on the uh, right, and we can see 1.75 is one of the representable numbers. So that's the most reasonable thing to do is return that exact value. And that is indeed uh, what the standard requires. How about if we add two plus an eighth? We can look here again. That's not a, one of the answers we have, but it's between two and two and a half. So the most reasonable thing to do is return the floating point number nearest to the exact result. In that case, that would be two. All right, and that is, in fact, what's done by default. Now, how about this case? One plus uh, uh, an eighth. Uh, we can look here at the representable values, and that's exactly halfway between uh, two representable numbers. So we're going to need some rule to break that tie in the special case, and we'll see that in the coming slides. can help a little bit to uh, graph this. So let's first consider the region of the number line uh, around uh, two and a half to three. And uh, we're going to be talking about a rounding mode. And a rounding mode here is a mapping from the real numbers to the floating point numbers. So to make, to make it clear that you can only return the floating point numbers, we'll get rid of the number line on the bottom here. So if we look at the region between two and a half and three, until you get to two and three quarters, you're closest to two and a half, right? So we should round down like this. This is how we get to the uh, nearest representable value. Now let's look on the other side. Let's say we're between uh, two and two and a half. Once we get to two and a quarter, we're closer to two and a half, right? So we should uh, round up in that case, like so. So, the, it, so this kind of drainage basin on the uh, number line represents how the closest value is computed. Now we can go through the same argument for all the other values here, and that gives a graph that looks like this. So we have all these little uh, 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 isosceles triangles, scaling triangles rounding down to different values here. Now, what happens when we get to beyond three and a half? Well, it, it seems reasonable, oh, oh, just a few examples here. So what should this, how should this value round? It should round down to two, right, if we're in this number range here. Uh, and to explain how the ties work, this is the value halfway between uh, one and one and a quarter. The, the rule that's used is called round to nearest even. So we look at the two uh, values that bracket, one and one and a quarter, so we go off on the uh, right here, and we see that the last bit of one is zero and the last bit of uh, one and a quarter is, is one, so the last bit of one, zero, is the even value. So we will round uh, down in this case. Okay, so we still haven't answered all the questions, though. What happens if we're on three and a half? We've run out of numbers. Well, if we... All the other values have these symmetrical triangles around them, so it seems reasonable to uh, extend a little bit more to get down to three and a half. But now we really have a problem because uh, we apparently don't have any other value to return. So this is where we turn to that trick of defining new kinds of values, new kinds of numbers, and we actually overflow to plus infinity. And this is the same thing that happens with float or double, but much farther down the uh, number line. Now this isn't the only possible rounding mode. This round to near Steven, there's other rounding modes you, you can define. One that you sometimes is called uh, round to zero. Or, or truncation. So we can uh, look what that looks like graphically here. Again, we get rid of the number line. And um, instead of having symmetrical triangles, now we have these right angle triangles because you're rounding down in this case. So let's look here. Uh, so we're going to round down in both cases. In particular, even though the value between two and two and a half is closer to two and a half, we're going to round down to two. And we also round down to three and a half, so we don't uh, overflow in the same way under different rounding modes. So what are the benefits of using round to nearest even by default instead of something like truncation? It is closest to the grade school rounding. It, uh, in a statistical sense, reduces the uh, round off error. And the little detail about rounding to nearest even avoids uh, drift in certain kinds of uh, summation loops. So here's a particular example to show how floating point associativity doesn't work uh, from the format we've seen before. We, we know that if we add one quarter to two, that will round down to two. All right, so let's say we add two plus a quarter plus a quarter. If we first add two plus a quarter, that'll round down to two, and then we add a quarter again, and it'll round down to two again. So the end result will be two. Let's say instead we add the uh, two one quarters together for one half. When we add that to two, that'll round up to two and a half. So floating point addition is not associative. Uh, this is true for this toy format, it's true for the, the real formats as well. A few fun facts about the floating point. If you get a subnormal result from addition or subtraction, that's actually exact. There's, there's no rounding involved, just how the uh, math works out. 
All float values are exactly representable as double values. And between every two uh, finite float values, there are about 500 million double values because of the extra precision. That means from a certain perspective, double isn't twice as good as float, it's 500 million times better than float because it puts you that much farther away from any kind of numerical problem you might run into. And uh, surprisingly, over 45% of uh, finite double values are numerically integers. Well, why is that? Well, we have a limited uh, exponent range, 53 bits. So if the exponent is bigger than the number of precision bits we have, when you multiply it out, you're just adding integers together. So this is uh, another reason floating point uh, shouldn't be so fearful. A lot of it's just integers, and, and no one's afraid of integers. They're very, very friendly. Integers are very friendly. You just have to go talk to them. Uh, just a quick point here, uh, completing the floating point arithmetic. Uh, we've already saw infinity uh, early in the talk. There's a few other values that come up. There's also nan and uh, minus zero. Uh, there are rules given in the standard for operating on, on these that uh, once you uh, recognize the need for the value, it's pretty straightforward to work through uh, what the rules should be. But we won't have to, thankfully, we won't have to worry about this uh, too much more in the rest of the talk. So that's the end of the primer, and we can move on to x87 uh, floating point arithmetic. Now, the x87 has been around for a while. The design was done way back in 1977. Maybe some people in the room weren't even around in 1977. And their transistor budget was 40,000 transistors. And with that budget of 40,000 transistors, you got correctly rounded arithmetic operations. But that wasn't all. You also got pretty good rounded transcendental functions uh, like sine and cosine and exponent. And that wasn't just for the float and double precisions, but also a double extended precision. That was a full 80 bits long with 15 exponent bits and a full 64 significant bits. And it also had a stack-based register set, although that wasn't uh, as good in practice as it turned out. Now, this work predated the IEEE standard and informed the IEEE standard. And uh, the IEEE standard actually dropped a number of features that were found in this chip, such as an uh, alternate way of uh, dealing with infinity. For the uh, floating point instructions there, there was a uh, control word. You could set the processor to round to float or double precision, but using the larger extended exponent range of the double extended format. So that means if you, even though you're rounding to 53 bits of precision, you're still getting 53, uh, 15 bits of exponent. And of course, 15 bits of exponent is more than 11 bits of exponent that you would uh, get for float. Now, if you were concerned about uh, the exponent bits as well, the way you could get that to round was doing a store to memory. So you could st uh, store to a 64-bit value to round the exponent. So you might think, OK, uh, we, we can round the precision. But there's a way to round the exponent. If I want strict double, maybe all I have to do is do the operation. Uh, that gets uh, the right precision bits, assuming I have the precision control set, store it down to round the exponent, and then load it back in. And, and that does actually work for uh, add and subtract. When, and we'll see whether or not it works for other operations like multiply and divide. And, and of course, you should be suspicious that the answer is no, it does not work for the other uh, operations. And to be equivalent, you have to get the same answer for all inputs, of course, and for all possible uh, values of the floating point fields here. And you also have to make sure that the handling of the special values, NANDs and infinities, uh, works out too. All right. So let's go back here. What, what we want to uh, replicate is the semantics we see under single rounding. Uh, so we'll use the, the toy format again. Um, so we, we're starting with real number line, and then for a single rounding, say around two and a half, we want to get, get down to that value. Okay? So let's say uh, we're going to do an intermediate rounding first. This is analogous to rounding on the exponent uh, stack with the extended precision. So instead of just having uh, the base values, we also have the uh, values of the extended exponent range, which are in the subnormal range of the original format. So we can start our case analysis. The special values uh, in this mode work out fine, and overflow actually works out fine as well. So we don't have to worry about that. Now let's start work looking about the, the uh, normal range for both formats, say around two and a half again. So we do the first rounding to the extended exponent format, and then we'll round again to the Second format. Now, in this case, the rounding doesn't actually do anything because the values are the same. So that's exact. 
And we'll see here that the uh, range being rounded uh, with the second rounding, uh, the range of the original number line is the same in both cases. So this is equivalent uh, for the normal range here. And we can do a similar analysis for all the other cases where the values line up with the same density. Now, that leaves, of course, the subnormal range where the values aren't lining up with the same density. So we'll have to look at what happens there. So first we'll look at the, uh, the um, first toy format without the extended exponents, and the rounding looks like this with the triangles. It's all very nice and regular. Uh, the triangles are each uh, one-eighth wide on the number line, and it all looks very simple. So now we'll introduce the intermediate rounding with the extended exponents, and it looks uh, like this. We'll have the number line, and we have more, more answers to go here. And we'll focus on uh, the transition between the subnormal range and the normal range, so around one half in this case. Now, when the values uh, are exactly representable in the intermediate format, there's no problem. We can just copy them over like this. Now, that leaves the cases where they don't line up. We have these extra midway cases here, so now we have to use the round to nearest even rounding rules for these other values, and that looks like this. Now, if you look from the top to the bottom now, you might start noticing some um, asymmetries in how the rounding is working. Now, remember, uh, there's a symmetric region around uh, one half that should round down to it, uh, from both sides that round to it. However, if we look carefully here, there's this little extra region. It first rounds up when you round to the extended exponent range, and then it rounds up again when you go from the extended exponent range to the final one. So this means there's a larger portion of the number line getting converted to uh, one half than there was originally. So this is a, a problem because we're not getting the same uh, answer back anymore. So this is at least a potential problem. Like what if we don't actually have any values that come up in this uh, narrow region to, to cause problems? So we can start going through the operations. Square root's not a problem if you had a non-toy format, square root doesn't overflow underflow, so that, that's not usually okay. Since uh, uh, subtracts and adds of, uh, that have some normal results are exact, we don't have rounding going on, so add and subtract are fine uh, with the situation. And for this, this particular toy format, multiply is not a problem either. The format has so few bits of precision, we can't actually get values into that particular range, so we kind of do dodge a bullet there. Then there's divide. Divide's always problematic. So divide's a troublemaker here. If you go through the case analysis, there are multiple quotients where the exact value is in that, that narrow range where we can't have the exact value to be. Uh, so that's going to cause a problem. We're going to get a different value under double rounding with uh, divide in this format than we would if we had a single rounding. All right. Now, we can construct the same value with uh, double, but before we do that, we're going to have to take a quick detour to pick up a special purpose tool hexadecimal floating point literals. Uh, have people seen hexadecimal floating point literals before? Uh, a few, oh good, good, I'm surprised, surprised so many. Uh, this has been in the platform uh, since uh, 1.5. Uh, it's very helpful for writing floating point tests and the like, and it's analogous to the uh, little binary representations we've been using as a textual representation of the significant and the exponent fields of the floating point value. It's a somewhat human readable, at least more than the uh, raw bits of a long so the one way you could write 3.0 as a hex literal is 0x3.0p0 read as 3 times 2 to the 0. That's not how the value is actually stored as a floating point number. It would be stored as uh, 1.8 in hex, or 1.5 in decimal, times 2 to the first. Okay. So we saw the value in the toy format between the transition from subnormal numbers to normal numbers. So let's look at that range for double. This is the minimum uh, normal value here. So we can construct the max subnormal. So we get 52 bits of uh, zeros as a fraction, and then uh, the leading bit is one with the same exponent. And we can go to the range of interest. So we have the, uh, all the bits of f. Uh, we want the next bit to be zero because we're not quite going halfway. And then we have a few bits of one. Now we can treat this value as an integer. Right? We can write it out here, and as an integer we can find its prime factors. And now what we can do, we can uh, try to construct a pair of double values whose product is that exact set of bits in the right exponent region. So 
that's not too hard once we have the factors. We can put two of them together uh, like so, and we can see copy the bits over into the hex floating point values. And now we just have to have the right exponents. And uh, when we uh, multiply these together, there's two results we can get. We can get the strict result, which is the smallest, uh, largest subnormal, if we do strict rounding, or if we, we are also allowed the legal non-strict rounding, where we get the smallest normal value instead. So one multiply, two possible answers. So how do we actually get the strict results on the x87? So what's going on here? Uh, so the, the key idea is to uh, try to get the processor to do the hard work for us in computing the, the significant bits. So we want anything that would be a subnormal in the final format to be a subnormal in the intermediate rounding format instead. That way the processor does the hard work. Um, and to do that, you have to scale down so that it would be a subnormal in the intermediate range. That's why we're multiplying down by this uh, huge factor, 1 times 2 to the uh, minus uh, 15, 360, which is the difference in the uh, exponent range between float and uh, between double and double extended. So we can see that that looks like here. We scale down one argument by the small value. We uh, do the intermediate operation, and then, then we scale it back. And uh, usually, the scaling up and scaling down uh, doesn't have any effect on the value. And this allows the intermediate operation to have the right significant bits we want. And on the x87, we do the store reload to enforce the overflow threshold. We can see that what looks like with the toy example to make sure it works. There's one of the problematic arguments. We can scale it down. In this case, the scaling factor is only uh, a half because the difference between uh, minus 1 minus 2 is 1. And this will get the right intermediate results here. If we didn't do this, we'd round up twice. So we'd get a, a final result of 1 half instead of uh, 3 eighths. A brief history of uh, Java floating point proposals. Uh, back in 1995, it was all strict all the time. In the first few years, there were a number of uh, people doing um, work on alternate proposals, uh, including uh, James, who had one uh, back in 1997. Uh, there was a concern to address the uh, impedance mismatch between the x87 semantics and uh, Java's uh, strict semantics. That led to, among other things, uh, this proposal for extension of Java floating point semantics uh, from 1998. This had not only strict FP, but wide FP. And wide FP allowed broad use of wider precision, which was a problem with uh, uh, predictability. So within a wide FP expression, the uh, VM would have wide latitude to, on a uh, expression on the floating point stack, to use not just float precision, but float extended precision. And one valid float extended precision is double. So you can imagine you have your float expression, and the VM can hmm, randomly, arbitrarily decide, oh, I'm going to round to float here, I'm going to use double for this one, and you'd have no way to protect against that. And uh, you know, th this would uh, make it very difficult to have a predictable program because you don't know if your values are going to be stored in float or double, which is going to affect uh, how they want. Also, you're not required to have uh, subnormals in wide of P expressions. Uh, during the uh, waning days uh, when I was a full-time student, uh, myself and others uh, sent feedback on this proposal once it was made public. There was also a Java Grande document, uh, Proving Java for Numerical Computation, uh, published in response to this. And acting on the feedback, instead of um, doing the Pedge Pitch proposal, uh, something more modest was done in Java 1.2. That was strict FP and craftily redefining the default uh, floating point semantics. So strict FP means use the original all strict all the time. But by default, uh, we are now allowed to use extended exponent range, but not more precision, uh, just for the results on the VM stack. There are some good features of the redefinition for default FP. It was enabled by uh, Roger Golliver coming up with a more tractable approach to uh, get exactly reproducible results. Uh, that's the approach I've been discussing uh, here today. And if overflow or underflow doesn't occur, you get the same results in default floating point as well as strict floating point. So that's a very helpful property uh, if you're trying to do semantics, because you often want to avoid overflow and underflow anyway. And for your name storage elements, your, your fields and your variables, you're always going to have strict semantics. So if you need to get exactly strict, you can do a store. Now, there are all some problems, though. So how do you print out one of these values with extended exponent range? Ba basically, you can't, because if you're going to pass it as a parameter, once it gets passed as a parameter, it can only hold the strict uh, floater double set. So all the extra information goes away. 
and there's no really me no ready mechanism to uh, force the extended exponent range to be used if it was available. And there are subtleties with the code generation. So what, what's done here, what was done here to allow um, simple code generation for x87, no other platform uh, benefited from the uh, flexibility allowed, allowed by this change. There are rather complicated semantics introduced in the floating point standard for all possible platforms. So uh, I've, this was a, a pragmatic compromise uh, for its time, but times have changed, and at this point I think it's more uh, important to have simple semantics for, for all platforms. And at least I, for one, would, never, would like to never have to think about default floating point semantics again. Uh, at, least, uh, someone, at least one person agrees with me. Uh, which brings to, to JEP uh, 306 to restore the strict floating point uh, semantics everywhere. So we wouldn't have to worry about these extended exponent value sets or the value set conversion. Uh, strict FP would be a no-op. And uh, potentially, the act strict bit would be, position would be up on the market. And I know Brian has uh, been uh, very uh, l looking with lustily after this bit position uh, since I mentioned the idea for this uh, project for him. Now, the uh, practical concern that led to this uh, change in the floating point semantics was allowing the x87 to run more quickly at a reasonable pace. But we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, pro x87 processors for many years have had SSC2 or later, and SSC2 or later supports both float and double on SSC instructions, which matches Java semantics perfectly fine. So there's no performance uh, uh, cost from uh, being strict all the time because people are using strict instructions anyway. Uh, so on, uh, for example, on default 64-bit uh, hotspot, it doesn't use the x87 registers at all. It only uses SSE because that's always there. So that's about uh, JEP 306 and strict FP. People are also in often interested about fast FP. How about we make fast FP instead? You know, strict, that's kind of dull. Fast, fast FP is more interesting. That's certainly technically possible. Uh, there's a known wish list of items. Maybe we could use fuse multiply add. Maybe we could use those algebraic transformations that only approximately hold, uh, and so forth. However, I think adding fast FP to the platform in a way that's consistent with the uh, spirit of Java would be uh, a little more challenging than people suspect at first. One reason is that it has few precedents. Few other platforms have cared as much about the precise floating point semantics uh, as Java had. And I think to do proper due diligence, there'd have to be an investigation of the numerical accuracy versus uh, speed trade-offs. One particular example of interest is uh, fuse multiply add. This is a uh, increasingly common hardware instruction that, as the name implies, does a multiply and an add as a single cycle, and it's fuse, meaning that there's one rounding error instead of two. And on hardware that implements this instruction, it's faster than doing a chained uh, multiply and add. There's some clever tricks you can do with this to do things like uh, correctly on a divide in software, and it helps uh, certain loops uh, run faster. In JDK 9, we added a method support for this uh, in the platform as well. Now, there's three possible semantics you might want to have for um, fuse multiply add, that you have to use fuse multiply add. The way to specify that, most straightforward thing, just call the method. If you s want the semantics that you must not use fuse multiply add, you could just use the you know, uh, multiply and add instructions in the platform. But let's say you want to have the semantics of like, I don't really care if you use, if you use multiply add, but if it's convenient and it's fast, use it. There's no good way we have to specify that third option. So if we go back to the uh, diagram here, uh, the, the interface a uh, language compiler would have to specify that third option is really lacking. So uh, options would include a new hardware, a new um, uh, JVM instruction that would be uh, onerous to add. So maybe we could get by with more code generation entry points instead to capture the sort of semantics that a fast floating point uh, mode would require. So I, I think uh, the uh, most expedient way to support faster floating point or looser semantics would be something like add a loose FP bit to the method and let the uh, VM guys do whatever they can figure out to the method. Uh, that would be fun for the VM engineers, but it wouldn't be very good for the people who would have to debug uh, what's going on. So I think a more uh, nuanced uh, API is needed. But we've seen examples of the platform where that kind of additional API is added. For example, in um, JDK 9, there was this uh, string concat factory added as a way for Java C or other compiler to uh, more easily 
can concatenate strings together. So Java C doesn't have to worry about uh, how it's buffered up or all that, and the VM doesn't have to worry about recognizing multiple coding patterns from different compilers that can change over time. So maybe we could add some sort of cogent entry point, like fuse if fusing is fast, otherwise it's okay, and so forth. And this wouldn't be an API that uh, end users would be expected to see. Likewise, for summing things up, maybe you don't care exactly how things are summed up, so you could have an API entry point like that. Maybe this looks similar to the vector API that we hear, we'll be hearing about later in the conference. Maybe one is built on top of the other. Uh, TBD, some more, more thought there required. There's some other floating point formats that might be of potential interest. Uh, there's uh, some use of half precision, 16-bit, in different contexts for GPUs and machine learning. Uh, I've heard machine learning summarized as a low precision matrix vector multiply. So this is where the 16-bit floating point comes in. There's also support for quad precision, 128 bits. This is part of the 2008 update to the standard. Various uh, architectures have supported quad, even predating the standard, but it generally doesn't have direct hardware execution, so it doesn't go very fast. Now, one of those documents from back in the uh, late 90s about improving Java for, for numerical computation had a wish list of features to come into the platform. And some of these features are still under discussion uh, in the Java community, including here at this conference. And it, for, example, for example, a number of these would be satisfied using uh, value classes, which we'll be hearing about later. Uh, so in conclusion, evolving the Java platform is a long-term effort. And I think it's important to clean up and retire uh, unneeded complexity so we can make room for some new complexity instead that's uh, more, more helpful. And I'm probably out of time, but I'll be happy to answer questions uh, during the break or uh, at other times during the conference. <laughs>